Hey, welcome, and I hope you're happy. I'm happy. We're in the fourth week, guys, so we're almost ready for our vacation. I don't know you, but I need a vacation, and it's been a very tough COVID time for all of us. Um, we've had to be in the computer all the time. Uh, the next semester is coming up, so hopefully we can get this class. Please, you know, work a little harder now so we can finish the semester and um, and get, get on with our lives. So basically, uh, this fourth week is about the 19th century, the 1800s. And it's a very, very exciting time. It's a very exciting time because we will have the interruption, the disruption, the sort of upset of something that will transform and turn the history of art on its head, okay? So first we go with truth. The first part of art is to copy reality, right? Or it was used for that. Whether that's the true calling of art or not, I don't know. I'm only an artist, right? So to copy, then to make it beautiful, then to criticize or to sort of comment or to sort of, you know, add your opinion on things. That's truth plus beauty divided by criticality. Up to now though, everything has been done by human hands, okay? Humans have since the caves until sometime in this 1800s, everybody has been doing things by hand. Now, thanks to the Chinese and the reproduction of the sutras, you know, in wood, which then became movable typeface or printing by Gutenberg arriving in, 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 in Germany and uh, in Europe, we have reproduction, mechanical reproduction, meaning I make a drawing here and I make a hundred copies of this, but I still got to make this first drawing by hand in the, in the rock or in the stone or in the plate, right? A metal plate, I gotta carve it and then I gotta bring the ink it and then bring the paper, boom, boom. And that had been going on for a couple of hundred years in Europe or, or longer, you know, since the Renaissance, people have been making prints, okay? but. A new process emerged. Remember the 1700s, middle of the 1700s? You have the Industrial Revolution. So it was only a matter of time till the Industrial Revolution affects art. And basically, you know, in 1822, you have the invention of photography. Now, photography, even though it wasn't invented by him, was popularized by a guy called Daguerre. Daguerre. So originally, the first photographs, you know, are called daguerreotypes, okay? He was called Luis Daguerre, Daguerre. And so people would talk about daguerreotypes. And so this is, this is incredible. This is incredible. By the 1850s, you know, it's, everything is about vanity. Why, why are paintings and portraits and sculpture busts so important? Because a powerful man or a powerful woman wants to be reproduced, wants to have their likeness be known so that they can exercise and weld more power. So now this trickles down and a father and a mother and a children, they go and get their photograph taken, okay? To sort of like, oh, finally we can have our likeness put it in our house. So there's like a revolution at all levels. And the most important thing is nobody has to use their hand. Yes, at the beginning, photography is complicated. You gotta put the camera, the guy gotta work with the lens, you know, that kind of thing. But but it's it's a perfect likeness. It's it's almost, they thought it was spooky and now it's, it's perfect. So but all of a sudden, is painting dead? Did painting get displaced? It's gonna take some time, but these questions are gonna arrive. And I'll tell you another thing, and we'll get to this in the next slide. The funny thing is, photography was still physical, right? You had to do it on a paper, print it. So there was still some physicality. Now photography just got killed 30 years ago with the digital world. Now, even photography, it seems antique, seems ancient, because right now the information just flows digitally. So you see, but that, that took what, 2000 years to get to photography? How long did it take from 1850 to, to the computer? Maybe 75 years, whatever, you know, less, you know, uh, 100, 150 years, you know, 
So time is shrinking, it's going faster. And what happens, you know, what happens in this era is that little by little, that first job of painting to copy truth is displaced and instinctively painters are changing, are changing their style, are changing the look of their work, are changing their aspiration. Painting for the longest time was about the conquest of space, the Renaissance, the Baroque, you know, the deep rooms, perspective, atmospheric perspective, all these things to give the idea of space. But now you take a picture and whoa, there's all the space you want. So painters started figuring, you know what? What the camera can't do is the brush stroke. There was no Photoshop back then, you know what I'm saying? So you had to do brush stroke and then that gives you the capacity to express your mood, your emotion, and that makes the painting not be about depth because a camera can do your depth, um, you know, perception, but it gets it to be about the surface. Painting becomes flat. It's just a bunch of a collection of marks. So anyway, here are some pictures, you know, early pictures. Look at them there. They're, when you look at these early pictures, people looking at them, there's like a, an aura. There's something like freaky, right? Mysterious, because there was still an element of formality picture of me there's a certain fear there's a certain concern now who cares people are taking selfie here selfie there picture here everything is picture people even take pictures of themselves committing crimes and then they get put in jail because there's like evidence you know I mean it's 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 crazy so um, so here's some early pictures and I'm gonna show you the last of the great painters of Europe before the whole thing is gonna transform itself. The last of the great painters of Europe is a guy called Courbet, Courbet, Gustave Courbet. And you see, you know, in the, in the 1850s, he's painting a burial, he's painting uh, workers, he's painting, um, you know, uh, an artist studio. Because remember, by now, the history, the big history, not the art history, we've gotten rid of kings. We've gotten rid of religion. So what is there to paint? Painting comes down to earth. Painting works with more common people, more common subjects. All right, so, so here we are, you know, and, and you have Courbet, the great painter, 1850s, and it's, we're almost saying goodbye to painting realistically. It's not as sharp, let's say, as Baroque or as perfection of the Renaissance. There is some brush stroke already in Courbet. There is brush stroke, you can see the brush stroke, but still the subjects are about reality. Courbet has not given up and said, oh, let the camera do it. He is doing it like it's been done for a thousand years. Now, oh, and then look at this, the origin of the world. Wow. So what happens after Courbet? Then we get, to one of the most exciting painters we're ever going to look at, and it's called Manet, okay? Manet. A uh, uh, Manet, Edouard Manet. So let me just erase here, give you a couple of, okay, after the Daguerre, the Daguerre effect, we have Courbet. Manet. I'm only going to give you the T people. Monet. So this is hard because they get confused. But the first one is Manet. And look at this. Dejeuner sur l'herbe. Lunch, uh, lunch in the grass, okay? Lunch in the grass. This goes all the way back to Giorgione from one of the monsters of the Renaissance. It's the same composition, okay? A woman with two dress guys, a naked woman with two dress guys in a park. But start looking at this picture and you can see that there's a lot of brush stroke, okay? The guy is doing the brush stroke a little bit more looser. He knows there's photography and then there's also something else. Now is the time to épater les bourgeois, scandalize people. So now there's also another element, shock. Like people are so busy 
It's already an industrial world. People can also see photographs, so they can take a photograph, they, they can have a photograph of themselves. But so now you also throw a little scandal. <sighs> Naked women in the park with two dressed guys. Ooh, who's seen that? So there's an element of shock. People, are, artists are looking for shock. Here's a comparison with Giorgione. Look at the Giorgione and look at Manet. So that's another thing. Since photography permits artists to look at the reality around them, artists start looking inside at the history of art for to get um, inspiration from the art itself. So here you go with Giorgione. And then one of the classics of painting, you know, in the, in the, in the modern era or 19, uh, you know, 1800, Olympia, Olympia. What is going on? Again, the scandal. This woman is naked, but she's not an object, right? Because there's a feminist reading of a lot of like the Venuses and stuff. They're, they don't look at you. They're looking down as if like, I'm here for you. This woman is not here for us. She's kind of looking at us like, what do you want? So there's like this challenge. So uh, some have argued that it is a feminist piece, even if it's been done by a guy. In any, at any rate, um, that's your, for you to decide. Each one will come to his or her decision. But, uh, but it's a very powerful piece, not only because of the female element and the confrontation, but also look, there's a class, there's a Marxist reading. She's got a servant, and the servant is black, right? Bringing her some flowers. So what is this naked woman looking good in a bed, confronting us with a servant bringing her flowers? What could be her job? I'll leave it at that. Um, no, looking, looking, looking. Um, no, 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 I, I meant leaving it at that. We'll keep going, guys, we'll keep going. Look at this comparison. Again, the woman as agent, active, and the woman as object. Look at the Titian, all right? So here's another uh, comparison. Um, so, and again, look at these two paintings, okay? This is the 3rd of May by Goya, who we talked about last class, even though he did, because he's more of a romantic. Manet is a pre-impressionist, before impressionist. And then look at Manet. Manet is painting the uh, killing of Maximilian. Maximilian was a, 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 a Austri um, Austrian prince that was sent by the French to rule over Mexico, okay? Because the French invaded Mexico. That's what we celebrate Cinco de Mayo when a poor bunch of miserable Mexicans defeated the French army with its new guns and its new uniforms and they showed up. So the Mexicans won the battle, but in the 1860s, the French won the war and they took over Mexico. Why? Because they had lost Haiti. They had lost their money in the Americas. So now they, they're excited to take over Mexico. And what happened? In three, four years, Benito Juarez, the great, the great Mexican patriot, he takes over and he kicks them out and he executes Maximilian. What I need you to know about this is, look at this again. The painter is painting history, okay? He's painting history, he's adding criticality to painting. That's Manet right there. Um, and, uh, and then another picture by Manet, Bar at the Folie Berger. A lot of women artists, a lot of, a lot of artists, but a lot of women, women artists, students like yourself, you know, a lot of people work in bars. You know, that's how you make your money. That's how you make your book. So look at this scene, this young woman at the bar. Again, is she object or subject? Does she, is she in control or is she just being looked at by the patrons that are mostly going to be males, right? So look at that. And then I just want to go to the most well-known impressionist because Manet was about society. Manet was kind of in the middle. He was a pre-impressionist. Now we get to impressionism. And impressionism is called impressionism because of a painting by Monet called Impressions at Sunset. Now take a look at the Monet's uh, Impressions at Sunset. Uh, sunrise, sorry, Impression at Sunrise. It's in 1872, 
And look at it. And people accuse them. This is the beginning. You've heard it. Oh my God, my child can do that. Who is this guy? I mean, how can he paint like this? Is it disrespectful? So this is again the shock. All right. Now the shock also comes. So naked woman in the park. That's shock. That's in the subject. This is the a shock of technique. All right. I, wow, the music is getting better and better by the minute. So now this this um, this technique. This is shock by technique, like violent, brutal technique. And all of a sudden people are shocked. Oh my God, he doesn't paint like Da Vinci or Michelangelo or the smoothness of the Baroque or like Courbet for Christ's sake. This guy's just throwing paint at it. So take a look at that. And then, you know, the rest of this century of the late 1800s, look at some of Monet's last paintings of the water lilies. They're almost abstract. Okay, before there is so-called abstraction, Monet is painting landscape, uh, landscapes, his garden, and he's making them abstract. Now, uh, I'm in a rush because there's so many good artists. I want to also show you Renoir, okay? Now, Renoir is a contemporary of Monet, and Renoir is painting leisure. Okay, so now what do we paint? We've painted We've painted kings. We've painted religious figures. We've painted uh, political events. What's there left to paint? Well, let's go back to that middle class. Remember in the Renaissance, in the Dutch, you know, the Dutch, how they created a middle class of business people. They didn't want religion because they were not Catholic, some of them. They were not kings, they were merchants. So they created a market of pictures that they could enjoy. So now Renoir goes back to that and he paints what? Leisure. People enjoying themselves. You and I, if we could get out, right? Because we can't right now, we're in COVID times, but we would be going out to a bar with friends. We'd go to a park with friends. We would do all these things. Applause. Uh, can you hear them? Can you hear them? All right, good. So here we are. Um, these are some amazing pictures of life, all right, in that time. These are some amazing pictures of life at that time. And, uh, and people are hanging out, obviously no COVID. And you have also brushstroke. Look at the brushstroke in the pictures. So I want you to remember Le Moulin de la Galette, 1876. And I want you to remember um lunch at the boat okay this is the painting of leisure now i'm going to stop because we're going to start next class with another fabulous impressionist painter edgar degas thank you